Do you know what peripheral neuropathy, or uh, also known as PN, is? Chances are, if you are diabetic or even pre-diabetic, as many South Africans are, it could affect you. I'm joined now by Dr. Annika Kutsir, a consultant, endocrinologist, and former president of the Society for Endocrinology, Metabolism, and Diabetes of a South African. She joins me virtually from uh, Cape Town. Um, Doc, thank you so much for your time this evening. Really appreciate it. A conversation that we really should be having repeatedly if we also look at the large number of South Africans that we believe are living with diabetes but I, uh, undiagnosed. Uh, explain to us what is PN and what causes it and how does it link to diabetes? Thank you, Michelle. So PN is the abbreviation for peripheral neuropathy and essentially it means that there is an, a disease or an abnormal function of the peripheral nerve. So the nerves are what connects our muscles to our central nervous system and the peripheral neuropathy in essence affects all these fibers. So uh we are, have been led to believe that diabetes only starts to affect the nerves in the extremities quite far, far down the line as you walk with this disease, but that, that's not uh, necessarily so. No, not at all. So what is quite disconcerting in daily clinical practice, we see that up to 20% of patients, that's one out of five patients that we see that are newly diagnosed with diabetes already have prevalent peripheral neuropathy, which suggests that either they had the disease for a long time without knowing, you refer to the undiagnosed component, or that there are other factors that contribute to the peripheral neuropathy. And you rightly also mentioned that diabetes is sort of, um, if I may, at the end of the line of glucose abnormalities, there is a long path that you follow mm. before you manifest with a high blood glucose in order to get the diagnosis of diabetes. So people who are en route to diabetes, as you mentioned, the pre-diabetes and obesity, they are also at risk to develop peripheral neuropathy. Um, talk to me about the numbers with regards to diabetes in South Africa. How prevalent is it based on the data that you have for people who have been diagnosed and what people like you believe are the undiagnosed people who are actually living with diabetes? Sure. Michael, so the official numbers from the World Health Organization states that the prevalence of diabetes in South Africa currently ranges between 6 and 11 percent. If we look at pockets of research that's being done on the ground and, um, you know, with reference to the South African Demographic Health Survey and so forth, the numbers approach near 15 percent of people that we know. So that is more than one out of 10 people that you see every day who, in fact, have diabetes. Now, two thirds of these people remain undiagnosed and the barriers to diagnosis is vast, you know, access to care, healthcare systems. People might not want to know if they've got a disease, but, but really this robs us of the opportunity to intervene early in order to prevent all of these complications such as peripheral mm -hmm. neuropathy. Now, we've had these kinds of conversations before, especially when it's World Diabetes Day or there's an awareness drive of some kind. And we do know uh, that in South Africa, there's a large portion of our, our population that's predisposed to diabetes, but also um, historically uh, people who do not access have access to the right lifestyle choices because poverty is such a massive issue in South Africa. So nutrition um, is, a, is a major stumbling block as well. In your opinion, what are the key challenges to to managing diabetes in our country. So, so you refer to a phenomenon that we call overfed but undernourished. So mm. this is where people have adequate access to calories, but the nutrition content of the food is suboptimal. Now, as you mentioned, purchasing power or the lack thereof is a big contributor. Um, also, the times we live in, you know, um, in terms of being in a hurry the whole time, you know, it's difficult to prepare wholesome food. We're also not sure that the quality of the nutritional content of the food that we are actually purchasing is adequate. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, I think these are significant challenges in everyday life to be able to get in all your vitamins and minerals that you need. And this compounds this problem of peripheral neuropathy in people with diabetes that you might not necessarily over and above the hypoglycemia get the right nutrition in order to conserve your nerves. And then of course those bad habits or those circumstances are passed down to the next generation and even if they are able to improve their circumstances they haven't learned um, what the right mix of nutrition is going forward. How important is education then in that regard? 
you. I think education is one of the most important things and most of the, one of the potent weapons that we have in our fight against diabetes. Mm -hmm. You know, if you educate people, they are able to make the right choices. Having said that, there are many other factors as well that prevent people even after they've been educated. And I think this is where we need to address systems and stakeholders on a multi-sectorial level, mm -hmm. you know, from a policy perspective up down to um, industry and so forth. So yes, education is vital. And I think this is where we can improve, we can educate healthcare providers, we can educate patients um, in the hope that they will be empowered to make the right decisions. But I think if we really want to win this war against diabetes and its complications, it will need to be a multiple stakeholder involvement. Um, what are you talking about the multi-stakeholder approach? Let's talk then about one of those stakeholders being government uh, and their role in the food industry. Do you think enough focus has been put on how we regulate how much sugar is allowed in our food that's made available on our, our grocery store shelves? Yeah. Sure. So, so with the sugar tax, I think we made great strides in the right direction. Um, you know, but that is one product. Um, mm. And, you know, in order to measure the, the outcome or the effects of that is not going to happen in two or three or four years. Because if you think about it, people have been exposed to this for at least 30 years. Mm. With regards to the nutritional content of food, that's that's another point that we need to address. If we think about the resources allocated to ensuring fortification of food and so forth, it is less than 0.4 percent of of the total budget, and you know even that is affecting the nutritional content and the food choices people actually make, unfortunately. One final question before I let you go, and it's a little bit more scientific, in that we keep reading about vitamin B and the importance of it, or the uh, uh, more of the focus that we need to put on the deficiency of vitamin D. What is the link between a vitamin D deficiency and diabetes? Sure. So when we think about links with diabetes, we think of multiple vitamins and minerals. Vitamin D has been blamed for various diseases. And if we look at the studies, vitamin D specifically is not necessarily causal, but it's been shown by association. When we look at vitamin B, for instance, we know that in contrast to vitamin D, that there's a causal relationship between vitamin B and peripheral neuropathy. So vitamin B in general are the vitamins that contribute towards nerve health, nerve regeneration, the utilization of carbohydrates in our diet and to form the blood, blood products. So this is essential for well-being. And, you know, I often think about this as a double hit phenomenon mm. where you've got a, a deficiency of a vitamin that might not have manifested with symptoms, but you've got the diabetes on top of it. And then there's a real threat that you might be able to develop the peripheral neuropathy without even knowing that you've got the vitamin deficiency. Should we all, if we're that way inclined, be going out there and buying vitamin B and start adding that to the vitamin C and the omega-3 that we're taking every morning? Yeah. We can't make a one-size-fits-all. I think it really depends on your risk factors and the diet you're actually able to take in. Remember, the B vitamins are water-soluble. So in order to ensure that you've got an adequate supply every day, you need to take in enough healthy foods, which are usually not very, let's just say, accessible to most people in, in our population. Mm. And you need to take those food and enough in quantity of that every single day. So it becomes quite difficult to reach the recommended daily intake without considering supplementation. But I don't think we've got enough evidence to suggest that people through the board need to take vitamin B supplementation every day. I think one needs to individualize care and I think one needs to focus on high risk populations if you want to get bang for your buck, mm. so to speak. Okay, well, you heard it here. Dr. Annika Kutsia, a consultant endocrinologist and former president of the Society for Endocrinology, Metabolism and Diabetes of South Africa. Thank you so much for joining us virtually there from Cape Town this evening.